Back in 1997, I was teaching computer graphics at, at 8.20 on Tuesday and Thursday for 75 minutes. Just and got up one Thursday, like 5.30. I couldn't, I couldn't see anything outside because it was snowing so hard. So at 7, I went out and started shoveling, trying to get the car out of the driveway. And, and I, I literally could not shovel as fast as the snow was falling. And my wife was giving me a lot of grief from the porch. You idiot. So um, I said, OK, she's right. Set down the shovel. I can't see the porch. I had to feel my way along the cars to get back to the house. It was, it was, it was impossible. In fact, we got a meter of snow in three hours. Had a great. It was March. It was the end of March, and um, had a great snowball fight that day. There was nothing else to do. The kids couldn't go to school. We couldn't. We didn't get out of the driveway until Monday morning. That was on Thursday. No, Thursday. Very poorly. So they have to do kind of a. They almost have to bring in loaders. Yeah. We got the, the, that day Hector got the record, national record for the most snow in the shortest time. Really? Yeah. National record includes you know, Alaska. Yeah, 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 and parts of Hawaii, which amazingly get snow. Yeah, they have a bunch of snow. They got a, that's right. And they got inches. Uh huh. Morning, folks. So, what strange things have we seen in lab? The vanishing PLL. Yeah. <laughs> Anybody else had trouble with vanishing phase lock loop modules? The, the, the thing which, on the, on the QSYS layout, I think it says something like system PLL. It was red, which means it couldn't find the module definition. So I'm guessing that somebody deleted it off the machine. I don't know why anybody would do that, but if you reboot, everything comes back. Those machines are in deep freeze. You can, you can throw away the whole operating system and reboot, and the operating system will be back. Any, any more thoughts on that? Anybody had that? Any, you, any, anything else on that? Also had a question on uh, M10K blocks. They, um, M M10K blocks have a pipeline register on the front end for address, data, and write enable. It's a one stage pipeline. These are all clocked. The main block of memory is clocked. That suggests that from the time you assert an address, until the time you get data out, if you're reading, is two cycles. There is an optional pipeline register on the, on the data output. If you optionally include that, it's three cycles. You can implement a one cycle write, or one cycle read, by fully pipelining this, right? by, by running the pipeline at full speed. Oh, it's a little hard to think about. I've done it with uh, interleaving, interleaving with a 50 megahertz clock, half the cycles can go to updating the, the VGA monitor, which only requires 25 megahertz data. 
and the other half of the cycle is you can use for random access to the same memory running at 50 megahertz and so but you have to then completely interleave and pipeline it so two cycles to get data out this one you were you were experimenting with dual read I think do, do, do these memory the memory blocks actually uh, support dual read Yeah, they, I, the, the, the M4K blocks, I haven't tried this with an M10K block. For M4K blocks, the architecture was such that you could, you could define one read and one write, but if you asked for two reads, it doubled the number of blocks. Because, in fact, it could only support one read address at a time. I don't know what the architecture of these blocks is. But you better check on that. If you intend to do a dual read, make sure that it doesn't use twice as many blocks. And you all know how to, you've, you've all looked at the compilation reports. You know, you can tell how many memory blocks you're using, how many uh, logic elements are in use, how many DSP blocks are in use by looking at the compilation report. I don't, th th these, these memory blocks, M10K, are read and write on rising edge. So it should be, that's how you're generally clocking your logic anyway. So that'll probably be just work with your, with your state machines. Sean, you had a question about column architecture, these column updates. Yeah. What was it? Oh, sure, yeah. You understand that I haven't actually implemented this. So it sounds really good, but I don't know the details, right? So there's going to be probably two M10K blocks here. Maybe not, but one for U and then uh, UN and one for u n minus one. <coughs> and you're going to feed these up to a, a compute block. And so on the first cycle, oh, and there's got to be uh, some sort of mux in here because you have to handle the boundary condition case. And Oh, except I put it on the wrong one. It needs to be on both. So there's a boundary condition on, on the on the on the history and as well as on the initial condition. So let's say that you read both of these on one cycle. <coughs> you can load up the compute module registers with the UN and UN minus one on one cycle. On the next memory cycle, you need to then output the, the J plus, plus one output from here. So if, if, the J, if the J index is going in this direction, you output UNJ, and then on the next cycle, you're going to output UNJ plus 1. Because you need the next cell down to do the computation. And at some point, probably about the same time, you're going to, you're going to bump the last column that you are, or the, the U N J minus one value up to here. So after you've done, t after two memory cycles, 
then you could do a combinatorial compute if you wanted to. You could do a combinatorial compute. And then you need, after that, you need a write back cycle where you, where you copy the M10K UN to UN minus one and you copy the compute back to the new value here. So I think it is doable in four cycles with two memory blocks. Anybody else have a, an opinion on this? You could certainly, you, you certainly could put a pipeline register everywhere and, and, and update everything on, and, and make it into a one cycle system at the, at the cost of some sanity, of just organizational stuff. So like anything else, if you're building a pipeline processor, the best thing to do is first get it running sequentially, then pipeline it. And, and there's feedback from here, but I think that that's not a problem in terms of timing. Also, the reads from out here are not a problem because those can happen in parallel with e any of these other reads. The reads from here have to be after you've up, you've uh, you've output the uh, you've copied the current value to the compute module so that you can you can get it from uh, the current value from both sides. So that could be on cycle two. Yeah. The things coming from the sides. Sample those, or could you just expose the UN register and just wire them? I think you can just expose the UN register. Okay. Yeah, I don't know. I don't think there's any. You don't need a pipeline register. In fact, you don't want a pipeline register because that delays things one cycle, and if you delay the neighbors one cycle, it is unconditionally unstable. Yeah. So I think four cycles. So that says that you're limited to about, unless you pipeline, you're limited to about 250 vertical samples in a, in a pipe here, in, a, in, a, in one column, because you'll run out of cycles at around 1,000. Of course, you might be able to turn up the clock rate, too. I suspect if you do this combinatorially, you will not be able to turn up the clock rate very much, but if you pipeline this computation, you might be able to. Uh, yeah. Yeah, sure. I, yeah. So there's, you're going to need a cycle to read UNJ. You need another cycle to read UNJ plus 1. At that point, you have enough information here. You can, you can insert the shift up to here any place on either of those two cycles. Uh, and you're going to update UN plus 1 at the same time you output UNJ. So there's two, two read cycles, a compute cycle, and then a write back to this register and copying the, the UI. U, UN to UN minus one block. If you can read and write the M10K blocks at the same time, couldn't you write back your compute and have last cycle read out? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yes, you could, yes. So, so. So if you overlap the write back with the next read for the next cycle, yes, you could certainly do that. 
That's right. You can read and write on, certainly read and write on one cycle. Yes. So you, three cycles then. Potentially. Potentially. Sounds like it. Yeah, well, you know, code that isn't written can do anything. From the marketing point of view. So, uh, what else? Lab, lab three. Audio codec going okay? But you got sound coming out of this thing? Off the, off the, not much, huh? Thursday. Sound. What else? What's confusing about this? Yeah. Well, I just had a quick question. So, like, if we want to get breakdowns, like, um, <coughs> the usage, you're going to have to fully compile, right? There's no way to get, like, some sort of a priori approximation. That's correct. That's correct. I mean, you, you, by, by properly structuring the code, you can make a pretty good guess that you're forcing synthesis in a certain way. Mm -hmm. uh, but until you actually see the synthesis results, you don't know for sure. For instance, if you ask for one more M10K block than actually exists, uh -huh. what happens? Well, what it does is it builds you one and uses up 10,000 logic elements. I'm confused why, uh, going back to the three cycle thing, why, why can't you do it in two cycles if you, on the same state or the same cycle that you output the U uh, J plus one, can't you also just compute it and then write back in that same cycle? Or is that too slow? I'm not sure what's so you're saying make this completely unclocked, unpipelined, yeah. and just read it back. So if you did that and you dual ported the read, so you could do both the reads at the same time. So then you have then you have a two reads here at the same time. Well, you could, all, you could still make it two cycles, as in uh, first cycle you... I'm sorry, two, uh, two, two, uh, two cycles to do the reads. Yeah. And in the second cycle, you copy that over there. And then in the next cycle, you copy back. In the same cycle. So the first cycle is like re you read J. Second cycle, you read J plus one, do the compute, and then write back. That's simultaneous. Everything happens on the edges. If you, if you output something and on the same cycle try to write it back, it ain't computed yet. Because now you're asking for a zero time compute. You can't, re, you can't, write, you can't write, this, write it out and on the same clock edge, write it back in. If you pipe, yes, if you pipeline every, everything, then, that right back can happen. then it can happen. That's correct, yeah. So you need a pipeline register here, here, probably not here. Do you need one there? To get the J to get the, one, you do. Yeah, and what about here? No. No. Yeah. You, know, I mean, you don't need an extra one. You can use the one that's above. And wrap that oh, this guy. Uh -huh. yeah. Interesting. Anybody going to go for the block oriented versus the column oriented? Nothing. Zzz. Time's a wasting, folks. In fact, one week from Thursday, we start lab four. So I need to start talking about lab four, like 
today, or at least by Wednesday. And uh, so I'll be happy to talk more about Lab 3. If, you're, if, you're, if you don't have any more questions about Lab 3, I thought I'd talk about floating point just a little bit more. We started that last time. I can't really actually remember where I got to on floating point last time. Where did I get to? I think I was describing the, the calls I was going to implement, the, the, uh, the hardware I was going to implement. Mark Eiding did uh, add, multiply, inverse square root. The negate's trivial, and I got that working. Floating point shift is fairly trivial, I got that working. Floating point compare is fairly straightforward. However, there's a lot of people that argue that a floating point equality is not well defined. Because to be equal, two floating point numbers have to be equal on every bit, and the bottom bit is basically noise. And so the only thing that makes sense to do is have a compare be greater than or equal or less than or equal. And that's probably what I'll implement as a one bit output. But would anybody like to argue for equality? Should there be less than, equal, greater than? Think about it. Plop it up on Piazza if you have an opinion. <laughs> Floating point to int and int to floating point are relatively hard to do. And interestingly, floating point to int is easier because the floating point format already has the scale of the number, the exponent, separated out for you. And so since it's already separated out, you can easily take the the fraction and shift it to the right position using the exponent and you're done. Going the other direction is not so obvious. Going from integer to floating point, you have to find out where the top one is, where the high order one is, which means you have to do a search <laughs> down through the, um, the bits until you get to a bit that is a one. And there are, are there are various ways of doing this None of them are particularly fast or small in terms of hardware. We'll figure something out. What else would you like to see on that list? So the The algorithms for doing this are full of picky edge conditions. It's just a nightmare to make sure it's all right. And um, I did a 9-bit version a while ago, but the marks uh, based on Schuyler's 18-bit version is a lot cleaner. I won't go through the inverse square root because that is truly a mess. You have to do all kinds of stuff. But the, but the floating point multiply is probably the easiest one to explain. I'll just do a little bit of that. Very first thing you do is you parse out the the sign, the exponent, and the uh, fractional part for the two uh, operands, remembering that everything it is not two's complement; it is sine magnitude, and getting the sign is the output sign is, of course, easy. You XOR the two bits together. And then you uh, do a flat-out integer multiply of the two fractions to get a 36-bit uh, product because these are 18-bit inputs. 
So there's the 36-bit uh, output. And you add the, the two exponents, because after all, they're exponents. But one of the things that happens with adding the exponents is, remember that they're both based that 2 to the 0 maps to 127. So when you add two of them together, you have now offset it by 254. So that you have to later subtract off 127 to get back to the right exponent base. And the conditions for the fractions are that the, the fractions have to be between 0 0.5 less than or equal to the fraction less than or equal to 1. Less than 1, strictly less than 1. So the product has to be between 0 0.25 and 1 product fraction. So if it's between 0.5 and 1, then the number is normalized and you don't have to do anything. If it's between 0.25 and 0.49999, then the top order bit of the product will not be 1 and the fraction will not be normalized, which is required for this. Normalized means it's left adjusted until the top order bit is 1. And so you would need to shift by 1. So the next thing that's done is to check to see if the, if the uh, top order bit is 1 and sub subtract off two different constants shift co corresponding to a shift left of 1 or none. And you have to subtract off 127 again, I said, because, so this represents no shift, and this represents uh, a shift of 1. And the, then the fraction, you choose either the top bits of the fraction or the next bits down. And remember that in Mark's format, in Mark's format, since the top order bit is always one, the top bit is always one, we don't even bother to store it. So you don't store, actually store the top bit, which would be bit 35, but rather you store bit 37, 34 through 17, or 33 through 16, if the, uh, if the product is less than 0.5. There's lots of edge cases here. And you've got to get them just right. And then he, he also then does an underflow to make sure that he's properly setting zero because his system does not underflow gracefully like IEEE format does. This thing says if it's less than 10 to the minus 38, it's zero. Just <laughs> truncates. And that doesn't sound, you say 10 to the minus 38, <laughs> it's nothing. Except on a log scale, it's still a long ways away. In fact, infinitely far from zero. <coughs> so you can plow through these things. And so I, I, I plowed through the adder, particularly because it was giving a wrong result. But I think it's right now. Um, I'll be happy to go over these in more detail, particularly if you end up using them for, for lab four. Although calculation of Mandelbrot set is also fairly straightforwardly done in, in fixed point. Any questions about floating point? Yeah. So how do you store a zero? Uh, in this case, zero is represented as all zeros. The exponent is zero, the sign is zero, and the fraction is zero. So how is that different from 0.5 to the power of minus 1.7? Because the exponent is zero. And zero is an underflow exponent. Okay. Because okay. that's, that's, that's 100, 127 powers of 2 less than 2 to the zero. Mm -hmm. yeah. 
Okay. So you're just saying, if it's that small, I don't care. Okay. I'm making it zero. Pretty much exactly zero, yeah. So for lab four, the basic thing you're going to be doing is iterating a complex function a lot. The complex function is that z of n plus 1, oh boy, another recursion relation is equal to z of n squared plus some constant c. And what you're going to be asking is, does, this does the magnitude of the complex number diverge to infinity? And <clears throat> or does it not diverge to infinity? Does it get caught in some sort of limit cycle and go forever through a series of of values. And if it diverges to infinity, by definition, it's outside the Mandelbrot set. And if it converges or stays bounded, it is by definition inside the Mandelbrot set. And so this is a very truncated version of a Mandelbrot set. The uh, the edge is fractal. The boundary is fractal. That means no matter how much you zoom, it's not smooth. This particular fractal is not self-similar. As you zoom, you see new features. At every scale, there's new features. And some people have called it the most interesting object in mathematics. There are people who spend their whole life finding groovy patterns at various levels of magnification. This was bigger in the 70s. Um, which is about the first time there were computers big enough to do this in a finite amount of time. The value C that you choose depends upon the X and Y coordinates. So the whole Mandelbrot set, interesting part of the Mandelbrot set, is between minus 2 and 1 on the x-axis and between plus 1 and minus 1 on the imaginary axis. <coughs> and the c you choose then, you, you, you choose some location here, you get a real and imaginary part and that becomes c. Then you calculate this function and ask, does it diverge or does it not diverge? And if it does diverge, you color it puke green. And if it doesn't diverge, you color it barf yellow. And that just happened to be the default MATLAB colors. I don't really recommend those. But uh, there's, and someplace down here, I did a little bit better color map. Oh, that's a little bit better color map. So this color map, uh, rather than saying merely, is it inside or outside, I colored it by the escape time. How many iterations did it take before the value of that function diverged towards infinity and then colored those, the log of that number as a color? Diverge to infinity. How long does it take to get to infinity? It takes a long time. But you could show, you can show that this particular function, for this function, if the magnitude of z is ever greater than 2, greater than 2, that the system will diverge. So what you're going to do then is you're going to iterate this function until it either gets to some maximum number where you get tired of doing it say a thousand times, or it, or it becomes greater than two. If it becomes greater than two, then you ask what the count is for there. You take the log of it and you make a color. So how do you take the log of a binary number?
to a very good approximation, the log of a binary number is the position of the highest one. So the log of that number is 3. So it is good enough for this, for this particular exercise to treat the log of the binary number as just the position of the highest bit of the number of counts it takes to escape above a, a magnitude of 2. So you're going to take this 3 by 2 region and you're going to map it into 640 by 480 pixels 480 pixels. So you're going to have to divide up the, 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 the two units across 480 and you're going to have to do a little bit of fractional arithmetic to figure out what one pixel is worth in complex number. But that's not so bad. However, that says that to get the at a zoom of one, when you look at this whole region, that you have about 240 pixels per integer step here, per, per one unit. So that says that one pixel is worth about 1 240th, which is about 8 bits. And so you need at least 8-bit resolution of the Y counter for you to be able to resolve every pixel if you're doing this in fixed point. You zoom 2 to the 10th times, now you need 18 bits. So the limitation on how much you're going to be able to zoom in, and one of the things I'm going to ask you to do is be able to zoom in and out. The, the limitation on the number of, uh, of times you'll be able to zoom in is determined by the number of significant bits that you carry in your calculation. So you're going to set C in some fraction between minus 2 and plus 1. Turn the set, oh yeah, Z of 0 is equal to 0. So that's the, that's the initial condition and then chug it along until it overflows. You might guess, and you would be right, that that every point on the plane will diverge in a different length of time. And that therefore you have to compute each point for a different number of cycles. And that it is therefore quite unlike the drum where you're computing every point on the drum for exactly the same number of time steps. So this, this calculation is different because you need to do load balancing. You're going to want to solve this as fast as possible. We're going to be timing this. And so, where does, this, where does this diverge the fastest, would you guess? Down a corner someplace. So it's going to diverge one step, boink, out. And so, that the CPU that carries that particular pixel is going to have to be reloaded with a new job, a new pixel, very quickly to compute the next pixel. Whereas anything in here is going to go for the whole thousand. It turns out that the shape of this, that's actually a circle, it's, it's distorted slightly because of the, the rendering. The shape of that, the and size of that circle and of this cardioid is completely known. So that you could say, for the cost of, of checking whether or not a value is inside the cardioid, 
I just won't calculate it. I'll just say it's inside. That speeds it up a lot. So the, and, and, uh, There's a bunch of examples from students. Uh, oh, there's the whole setup from Scott. Let's see if we have uh, a zoom in of something he did. Okay. That's a, yet a different color map with the interior colored black, which is kind of good. This is zoomed in someplace in the middle of the set, and you get these spirals. And it's beginning to get a little muddy in here because he was running out of uh, um, bits. Rick Wong, yet another region. And we're going to ask you to, oh, now that's a, that's a good color map. Uh, we're going to ask you to choose to find a couple of your favorite regions. And what I'm going to ask you to do is to be able to draw the whole set and then choose a crosshair location, hit the button on the mouse, and have the, the, the region around there zoom to factor of two. So you'll zoom in recompute the pixels. Now if you're clever, you can reuse one out of four. But uh, zoom in, recompute the pixels, or click to a region and zoom out. And of course you have to make sure that you're, you have to take care of the boundary conditions when you zoom out or in. But you should be able to explore this fairly easily. It's an open question whether you can find your name in here. 600 zoom. Oh, at a 600 zoom, there's another co almost copy of the Mandelbrot set down inside this thing. In fact, there's an infinite number of almost copies of the outline of the Mandelbrot set within the boundary of the Mandelbrot set. Asymmetric. Here's one that's almost a little wonky. It's a little off. It's everyone's a little different. This one's a little bit skewed like this, but this is some way down in the edge of the of the set someplace. So you can go hunting for interesting stuff. Assuming that you're going to use about a thousand as your cutoff for an iteration, then maps nicely into nine or ten bit color, color values, zero bits, one iteration through ten bits, ten twenty four iterations. And so you only need to take, keep a color map of around ten colors or so. Maybe a few more, but not certainly not more than 20. And so in principle, you could make the color mapping interactive too. If you stored an array of the, of the numerical values, you could play with the color map in real time. I'm not going to ask you to do that, but it's possible to do. An interesting, by the way, an interesting final project would be to accelerate this whole thing so that you can fly through the Mandelbrot set at, at 30 frames a second, right? Just, just, brrr, just zoom in, fall down into it. If you, if you go to YouTube and look up Mandel Zoom, you'll find more than you ever thought anybody had compute time for. And if that's not bizarre enough, there's at least one 3D generalization of a Mandelbrot set that's known that you can render in 3D. 
Now, why does this seem unlikely? 3D complex numbers. Anybody remember anything about that from complex analysis? They don't exist. 4D does, but you can't form a, oh dear, you can't, you can't find an operation that forms a field under, in three dimensions. You can't, it's not self, it's not closed, it's not a closed operation. So, um, there are no 3D complex numbers, which means that the 3D Mandelbrot is not really a Mandelbrot set, but it's pretty cool. Um, And in this case, my guess is that you're going. Well, we're going to talk about pipelines on this, how to how to pipe this. But my guess is that people are going to build any place between one and twenty complex pipelines that do this iteration, and do between one and twenty points at a time. And there are two serial bottlenecks here that slow the system down. First serial bottleneck is how do you tell which pro what pro what point should be computed by what processor? The second serial bottleneck is VGA, doing the serial write to the VGA buffer memory. So the students who manage to solve this the fastest are the ones that figure out how to get rid of those two bottlenecks as much as possible. One way of doing it, well, the VGA bottleneck is hard to figure out, although a small FIFO probably helps on that. Because there's going to be a lot of calculations that are relatively long and a few that are quite short. And so if you can FIFO it up, you can keep a high average write rate but in terms of dispatching operations, I've seen people do every conceivable different way of breaking up this space. Some people send blocks off to processors. Some people send slices off to processors. Some people say, I'm not going to dispatch anything at all. If we have 10 processors, I'm going to break the region into 10 parts. You guys go. And you don't send any data except the initial points on the corners. Each, the, each, sli each slice then computes its boundaries and starts iterating through them. And that gets around the serial bottleneck for di dispatch as well as anything I know of. Don't do it. Just assume that you're that the space is fairly well distributed. Now for the initial set, for the full set, that's not a very good approximation because there are clearly some spots that are going to be much slower than others. But if you're zoomed in fairly far, then it's not obvious how long any point's going to take. You may as well just take take that block of lines and give them all to the processor one, that block of line and give them all to the processor two, that block, all the processor three, and it'll be pretty well balanced. If your system breaks down at high zoom, I'm not going to worry very much. This is not, I'm not asking you to do extremely high precision here. There's a natural the multipliers have a natural size of 18 or 27 bits. It might be reasonable to do this whole thing in 4.23 format. 27 bits fits into a one DSP unit. Four bits? Uh, let's see. So that's plus or minus seven dynamic range of plus or minus seven. That's enough to detect a 
maximum of plus or minus two with a little room for overflow during the calculation, you could probably actually get away with 3.24 with only plus minus three uh, dynamic range. The MATLAB simulation suggests that works. I don't know if it always works. I think that it does. So you can do a complex square and add, complex square and add, complex square and add over and over again, mixed with taking the magnitude of this, so it's the square root of the sums of the squares. Square root! Don't take square root. No. Rather, you want z squared greater than 4. <clears throat> If you actually calculate z squared, magnitude of z quantity squared, you've done half the work for z squared in the next step. So you can save those results. The, the overflow calculation for one step becomes half of the arithmetic for the next step. By way, I mean, we'll talk more about optimization. Yeah. So you, you, you want to have an exponent that's bigger than 100 based above, has, which has a dynamic range of more than 256? Well, no, just don't center it around 127. Like, don't center oh. it. Oh. Because you're not concerned with more than 7, so you don't need the upper. Like, so that would give you much smaller fractions. That's an interesting, yeah, that would, that would probably work. That gives you, that gives you, uh, as much as another 120 orders of uh, 120 powers of 2, divide that by 3, and you get another 40 powers of, of 10. Yeah. There is, a, there is a theorist at, I think, MIT that says, who says that IEEE floating point is so 20th century. And he is um, uh, suggesting a yet more complicated format where the range of the exponent changes dynamically depending on the number. Oh dear. So there's three fields now, there's, or four fields. There's a, an exponent, a dynamic step of the exponent, and who knows what else in there. Uh, you can watch the video, it's, it's very compelling. I'd hate to write the Verilog for it. Okay, we'll talk more about this next time.